Hello again, everyone. Today, I'm very happy to present our series of webinar for scarring alopecia. As usual, before I start, I wanted to thank my technical support, Edgar, for helping me to do those webinars on YouTube. Without his help, it will be impossible for me to do it. Thank you, Edgar. Today, my guest is Dr. Nicole Rogers. I met her about seven years ago at New Orleans Patient Doctors Conference. She asked me to come and make social media presentation and introduce me to CARF, presently Scarring Alopecia Foundation. I'm very grateful for that, and thank you for your time and sharing your knowledge with us. Dr. Nicole Rogers is a fellowship-trained hair transplant surgeon and board-certified dermatologist. She and her team of highly trained technicians have successfully treated hundreds of patients with hair loss using the most cutting edge techniques. She graduated from honors from Harvard University and moved to New Orleans to attend Tulane Medical School. As a dermatologist resident at Tulane, she was chief resident and helped rebuild the training program after Hurricane Katrina. She spent a year long fellowship studying hair transplantation in Manhattan before returning to New Orleans to practice. Dr. Rogers has written and spoken extensively about surgical and medical treatments for hair loss, including contemporary techniques in hair transplantation, minoxidil, finasteride, and the use of low level light therapy for hair growth. She has co-edited two textbooks on hair transplantation and has written numerous chapters for other textbooks on hair loss and hair transplantation. Since starting practice, she has been featured in television, radio, newspaper, internet, and magazine reports discussing surgical, medical, and cosmetic approaches to thinning hair. Dr. Roger is the past president of the Louisiana Dermatologic Society. She is also an assistant clinical professor at Tulane Department of Dermatology, where she teaches the resident about hair and scalp disorder. She is a contributing editor for the Journal of Dermatologic Surgery and serves advisory roles for the International Society of Hair Restoration, Surgery, the Scarring Alopecia Foundation, and the Louisiana State Board of Electrolysis Examiner. She has a passion for treating all forms of hair loss using the most up-to-date medical and surgical techniques. Well, thank you again, Dr. Rogers for coming in, in uh, doctor, we'll make a small presentation and then we'll go to Q&A. And now I'm going to pass it over, stage is mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Well, Hacho, thank you so much for the kind um, introduction. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> um, and, you know, I feel like it's been very wonderful knowing you as a friend for many years now, because we both share in common a passion for um, you know, helping those patients affected with scarring alopecia. Oh, sure. So this is a tough condition. Um, <clears throat> and um, we're going to um, talk a little bit about it. As he was saying, I am based in New Orleans, my favorite city. Um, and um, I am affiliated with Tulane. I have no relevant disclosures. Um, you know, and I'm opening with this slide, which basically just talks about how big of a deal hair is to all of us. You know, this was um, some data from the American Academy of Dermatology. And it's interesting because, you know, it talked about how men were affected. And, you know, you can see how um, it was, you know, it's a smaller percentage of men, you know, who are are very extremely upset. 28% compared to women who can become 70% very or extremely upset, you know, and, and, you know, any kind of hair loss, even that which is maybe not outwardly obvious to people around them can still affect how, how we view ourselves. And um, so, you know, whatever we can do to be proactive, you know, is something that I think every dermatologist wants for their patients. Um, so, you know, there's, we break our hair types of hair loss down into scarring and non-scarring alopecias. You know, the non-scarring alopecias are generally you know, easier to turn around, right? Because if you can identify the cause of hair shedding, say with telogen effluvium or hair breakage, um, trichorexis nodosa, you know, <clears throat> alopecia areata is more of an inter um, autoimmune condition, but at least we can try and treat it and regrow it. Traction alopecia, you know, that's from pulling. Um, and then androgenetic alopecia, these are, these are more, they're more treatable, 
you know, um, what's tricky is these sort of conditions where, you know, patients present and they tell us, you know, my scalp really itches, I'm losing hair, you know, and it's sort of beyond their control. So, you know, step one is, I'm sure many of the people in the audience know already, is just getting that initial biopsy, you know, um, where the dermatologist uses dermoscopy to find areas of uh, erythema or redness around those follicles, and then, you know, use a little bit of lidocaine and then sample the skin using a, a little, almost like a cookie cutter. And this is important to get a good pathologist because that will help interpreting you know, the correct diagnosis. So, um, you know, what we know about these conditions is that the inflammation usually attacks the topmost part of the, the hair shaft. And this, I know you guys all know Dr. Jeffrey Donovan. He's well-loved within the scarring alopecia community, and he's done so much research and education. Um, but he created this diagram a while ago, and I love, I love that he still allows me to use it, basically showing how inflammation that um, attacks the top of those follicles can be very damaging. Whereas when it's lower down, it, those hair follicles have a better chance of coming back. So, you know, here we kind of roughly group the different scarring alopecias. Um, you know, usually we see the things like LPP, FFA, um, you know, pseudopalata, Brock, Gram-Little syndrome, and postmenopausal females. Um, in our African-American patient population, we see CCCA and um, chronic cutaneous lupus or discoid lupus is the other term we use. And then um, young men will present with um, either di dissecting cellulitis or folliculitis to Calvans. But what do we see the most? What do I get asked to transplant the most often? It's basically these three conditions. So lichen planopilaris, frontal fibrosing alopecia, and central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia. Um, LPP, as you all know, it usually starts with sort of these round areas of smooth, shiny skin. You know, it can be over the crown or the parietal area. Um, you know, and early on, it can be very itchy. Um, it may burn out over time, but you know, we can never really let our guard down. It's easy when you're initially looking at these conditions because you can see redness around those hair follicles. And then you can see basically white scar tissue, um, you know, where it's that the confluent scar tissue has represents the permanent loss of, of those follicles. So, <clears throat> you know, patients who are not well controlled or just have really aggressive disease, you know, they may, they may even show up at a late stage like this woman did here. Um, men can also be affected by this condition. And um, you can see up close how, you know, the permanent loss of follicles can occur here. Um, with frontal fibrosing alopecia, it's, you know, obviously it's histologically similar under the microscope, but the clinical presentation is different because it seems to involve not only the eyebrows, but also the frontal hairline. And this is an even newer condition. It was only first described in 1994. Um, and we originally thought it was just in postmenopausal women. Now we're seeing it in all different ages. <clears throat> we're seeing it in black women. We're seeing it in men. Um, you know, with black women, it can be tricky because you have to make sure you're not missing some kind of, you know, traction alopecia can, can also look like this. So we have to make sure that we're, you know, thinking about all things, but usually the loss of the uh, eyebrows is a little bit of a giveaway. And then with frontal fibrosing alopecia, you know, this in men, what to what gives me the tip off is when they usually lose their eyebrows. Uh, this gentleman, this these are two different gentlemen, but see how asymmetric his hair recession is. You know, he was actually booked to to go straight to hair surgery in another clinic and they didn't realize what his actual diagnosis was. So he hadn't gotten any medical therapy yet. So medical therapy is very important, you know, and there's lots of different treatment regimens, usually starting just think with things like topical steroids and doxycycline is a great start. Um, I use a lot of Plaquenil in my practice, but, you know, we can move to stronger things like cyclosporin and Celsept, um, <clears throat> you know, even prednisone in some situations. But I know the real thing you want to talk about today is surgery. So when is it time for transplant? And basically, the bottom line is um, 
not that different um, of requirements as it is for my non-scarring hair loss candidates. Basically, they need to be in good general health. They need to be stabilized. We, who, you know, my ideal regular hair transplant patients, no symptoms of itching or burning or tenderness. They have to have good donor density, right? They've got to have good hair in the back. And then, you know, I have to, you know, feel confident that they have realistic ex expectations. You know, I can't turn them into Cindy Crawford or Brad Pitt, but, you know, I can hopefully improve them. So for my scarring alopecia patients, <clears throat> you know, they also need to be in good general health. Ideally, they need to be stabilized on, you know, in um, medications for two years, you know, and they need to be at a point where they're not having any shedding, they're not having any itching or burning or tenderness. Um, <clears throat> and again, they have fairly good donor density. And you'll see the, the bottom line in yellow, willing to take the leap, right? So they're, they're willing to say, okay, I'm going to try it. We, you know, we don't know for sure if it's going to grow long term. But obviously, you know, these are the three conditions that we just have to be very cautious. Um, and sometimes doing a test transplant before we move forward is a really great idea. So hair surgery, fortunately, has come a long way. Um, you know, back in the 30s, they were using punch grafts to treat uh, different things, um, including cicatricial alopecia. You know, the problem was those Barbie doll hairs, they looked very pluggy, you know, and so cosmetically, they were sort of a failure. Um, and we've come to use the term plug as really a four-letter word because now we're using individual follicles. But there's two ways that we can move the hair from the back. Either we can take a linear strip, as you can see um, with this woman on the left. That's basically we, where we take a linear section of hair bearing skin from behind the tops of the ears. Or we can harvest them as individual follicles one by one. And a lot of men opt for this technique because maybe they want to be able to continue to shave their head in the future without worrying about having a linear scar. <clears throat> So we try and keep patients very comfortable during the surgery. You can see how they're laying in a prone position while we do the harvesting. And, you know, we ask them what kind of music they like and give them pillows. Um, we use some gentle uh, techniques to infiltrate the area with anesthesia. And, you know, we're talking, I'm trying to distract them as we're going. Um, and then once that tissue is removed, it gets slivered into individual follicular units. So um, here's one of my nurses at work under the microscope, separating that strip into little slivers. And then each sliver is converted into one to four hair follicular units. And here's the team hard at work. You can see them all working under the microscope while they're doing that. Then I'm numbing the areas to be transplanted, creating hundreds of little tiny incisions. So when we do our FUE donor harvesting, you can see how we're we're basically numbing a bigger surface area, but we're pulling them out as individual follicles, and we're just kind of working our way around the head from the from the right side to the left side. So once those grafts are out, we create little incisions for where they're going to go, and then we start placing them back, and we just use little, um, you know, hand a little uh, specialized forceps. Um, and then what happens is the body's natural clotting factors will act as a glue to hold those grafts in place. So um, this is what it looks immediately post-op as it heals. You can see there's, um, you know, some scabbing. Um, <clears throat> and then those scabs usually drop off over about, you know, one or two weeks. And then at the one month mark, it looks like nothing was done. It basically is um, back to looking like the, you know, some, the person looked beforehand. Now this is just androgenetic alopecia. I'm showing you this first. So you kind of get a guideline, but I'm going to show you some, some little case studies that we did as well with the scarring alopecia. And this gentleman, he actually came back and did another pass later, um, to fill in his crown. So, so this is a woman who had lichen plano pilaris, and you can see how it did affect her in sort of a typical female pattern hair loss distribution. But when you look carefully at how irregular those patches are and how shiny that skin is, you can realize, okay, this is, this is not your typical female pattern hair loss. So she was seen, I think I actually saw her 
in my old clinic and we did a biopsy, which confirmed lichen planus pilaris. And we just started her on some simple things, you know, topical clobetazole, some doxycycline pills, um, some topical minoxidil, <clears throat> and then eventually got her on to hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil, which she took twice a day. And she had a dermatologist that she saw in Baton Rouge as well. Sorry, my cleaning people are here. Um, and so they were also helping to manage her. Um, but, you know, she was interested in hair surgery. And so if you took a look at her donor area, you can see it was not great because she actually did have some areas of scarring even in her donor area. Um, but we decided to just start with a small test transplant. And um, <clears throat> again, you know, we kind of were pushing the envelope a little bit in terms of not being formally two years, you know, um, after she started on the medications, but at least it made her feel better like we were doing something. So we did a little test transplant and this is, you know, before and immediately post-op. Um, and then um, you can see that little area um, where it actually grew in pretty nicely. So this is about nine months later. So so this is her before, and then this is her, her nine-month post-op photo. Um, and she basically said, okay, well, I'm going to commit to staying on the medical therapy. She continued to see um, her dermatologist in Baton Rouge, who, you know, was very good about communicating on, you know, her treatment. Um, unfortunately, the hydroxychloroquine was not enough because she had a little bit of a flare. So at that point, Dr. Murphy changed her to acetretin, um, which is sort of a cousin to Accutane. Um, and, you know, it's one of the treatments that we can use. She also was giving her steroid injections every three months and she was keeping, she was having her continue with the topical flucinonide. Um, but she said, you know what, I really want to try this. I'm really bothered by my hair loss. You know, how can we move forward? And so this is, I literally lifted this verbatim from her note. Um, you know, basically how we had talked about moving forward with a few hundred graph test case. Um, we talked about how, you know, there wasn't necessarily any guarantee they would grow either short-term or long-term. <laughs> um, we talked about how the trauma of the surgery could trigger or worsen LPP in affected areas. And, you know, basically she was willing to take a chance. So that was in December of 2019. So here you can see by January of 2020, we moved forward. We harvested a linear strip. From the back of her scalp, it was about nine centimeters long by one centimeter tall. And we ended up actually getting over 500 grafts. I wasn't sure, you know, since there was a little bit of disease process, even in that area, I wasn't sure how many grafts we were going to get. Um, but it was enough, as you can see, to kind of fill in that frontal half of her scalp. Um, and here she was about a year later. And, you know, she was happy. She liked it. She felt better about herself, you know, and she had an easier time covering that. Um, but she said, now, what about this area? <laughs> and so that became the second area that we decided to tackle. So in late January of 2021, we did a second small procedure um, and we basically took an eight centimeter strip. We got just under 500 grafts. And we started working in that area. And so she had she had good growth in that area as well. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. But you know, if you if you look at where she is present day, you know, she has a, a much easier time, you know, kind of camouflaging that. <clears throat> and she's basically now committed to staying on the medication. You know, she's actually now on cyclosporin. Um, she's also taking hydroxychloroquine. She's back on that. She's on dutastride. She's using clobetazole shampoo a couple times a week, and then she still uses topical fluosinonide. So, you know, um, we unfortunately we can never totally let our guard down. Um, this was a study looking at, you know, whether hair surgery could be done for frontal fibrosing alopecia, and they did this retrospective review of 51 patients. This was in Spain. 
um, who had been stabilized with medical therapy for 15 months and they uh, underwent hair surgery in the temple. So that's, that seemed to be an area that really bothered people, the frontal hairline and then the eyebrows. And you know what they showed was that it was only about 50% survival of those grafts um, at the five-year mark. But the fact that 82% of the patients were happy and would do it again, you know, goes to show you that, um, you know, there's, there's definitely some value to that if it makes people feel better in the meantime. So I was always very hesitant. I, you know, this was probably our first case that we did uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia. This was a gentleman who had been uh, treated by a dermatologist up in Boston and, um, he was just really bothered by the fact that he didn't have any sideburns. And, you know, even though he had just retired from his job, you know, he just, he did not like how it looked. He didn't like how it felt. So he came down and we did a, a, a small case. I can't remember exactly how many, but we ended up doing both of his sideburns. And last I talked to him, he was really happy with it. I think that was, he was about two years out at that point. Um, this is a woman who we um, who we did transplant with frontal fibrosing alopecia. <clears throat> she noticed some hair thinning in seventeen. She had she actually had undergone eyebrow tattooing in eighteen, and I think that happens a lot in the FFA community. You know, women don't realize what's going on or why they're losing their eyebrows, but they go ahead and they deal with it cosmetically. And then eventually it starts affecting their hairline and then they, you know, get help from a dermatologist. So same thing with her. She finally got a biopsy in 2019 and we started her on um, sort of the, the usual cocktail of, you know, topical clobetazole, doxycycline, transitioning to hydroxychloroquine. And she, since she was postmenopausal, I could also put her on dutasteride. And um, she's been on, she's actually been on oral minoxidil. Um, but this was a, this is a neat case because, you know, she, again, she was willing to take a leap. She said, I, I really just want to get my hairline back. Um, she works in the food and beverage industry and the sales side of things. So she's always in front of people. Um, and she just wanted to, you know, feel more comfortable with her appearance. So um, we had done this and this is only her four month result, but already she was excited and, you know, feeling better. So the third condition that we do transplant, um, CCCA, you know, basically stands for central starting in the vertex, centrifugal moving outward, cicatricial, which is a medical term for scarring, alopecia, which is they just catch all term for hair loss. Um, you know, we see this so often in women in our um, African-American community, and it really does seem to be familial. It seems to be passed on the maternal side that being said, there are a few cases of men who have CCCA, and, and so um, it's not uncommon for that to be misdiagnosed as male pattern hair loss, and they don't actually get the treatment they need. Um, but it can improve with medications. This was a patient of ours who improved after a year on oral doxycycline and topical clobetazole. You must think that's the only thing I prescribe. I promise it's not, but it is usually the thing I start with, and most people do really well with that. Um, because it basically tackles the inflammation. Clobetazole works from the outside in. Doxycycline works from the inside out. <clears throat> um, and then, you know, this was an interesting paper. Valerie Callender is very well published in the Journal of Derm Surge. And this was a basically a test case where she used the punch graphs that we were talking about at the very beginning, she used four and five millimeter punch graphs to uh, fill in the area affected by CCCA. And so I actually did a few cases of my own. This is this is one that I did. Um, and I liked that they grew. I didn't like how they looked pluggy. <laughs> so, you know, we kind of went, we kind of changed the way we started doing our test transplants. Um, instead of doing several four or five millimeter punch biopsies, we basically use one eight millimeter punch biopsy, which usually will give us about 20 to 40 grafts. Um, so when we harvested for this lady, we that's exactly what we did. We just took a single eight millimeter punch from the back, 
And then you can see how we got the individual follicles to grow and she had very good growth at, at five months. So this is a lady, she actually had several surgeries and actually I think this, this is a different lady from the first one I just showed, but here's where we took it from. And then we use a little you know, diagram to measure where we put those graphs so we can make sure we know where to look you know, six to three to six months later. Um, and then it's always exciting when we start seeing them coming up, sprouting up. And then um, the same lady is the one that um, she had a couple of series of surgeries that really helped fill that in. So basically the moral of the story, I hope I didn't overtop myself, um, was, is just that, um, you know, obviously the hair transplant does not address the underlying disease process. Um, and you really have to continue to either observe for possible disease activity or stay on the medical and or stay on medical therapy. I really don't encourage people to ever let their guard down, even if they get a hair transplant. Um, and then just don't be upset if, if they, the graphs do thin out over time. We're just, we just, you know, we're, we're kind of rolling the dice when we try and transplant it. But, you know, I think for so many people, it's worth it in the short run if they at least do get some cosmetic benefit. Um, and I know you guys are all familiar with the Scarring Alopecia Foundation. Um, so it's very near and dear to my heart. If you ever have any extra money and you want to send it to them, they really appreciate it because it helps keep their programs functioning as well. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, thank you, doctor. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, 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 you're okay. We have time. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks for your great presentation. Uh, now we have uh, quite a few questions, if you can ask. Those are all from our members, from the group members. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, I have a, a little uh, something to say. At the beginning of your uh, presentation, I think you talk about percentage of the male and female, correct? Yes. Yeah. Now, I think I just wanted to tell you our group percentage, which I think we go 93% women and 7% men. Oh, wow. Okay. And just to just to give you an idea. Yeah. How, maybe there are other reasons why is it like that, but uh, but technically it's 90, 93 to 7% men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a difference. So. Okay. So I'll start asking my questions. Uh, the first one is, when hair transplants are successful for those with scarring alopecia, FFA, LPP, whatever the case, what, helped, what helps make for a successful transplant? What is the recommended long-term post-care? Yeah. I mean, I guess if I had to just pick one thing that would be like the, the easiest for people to incorporate on a regular basis, it would be something as simple as clobetazole shampoo. You know, because um, everybody has to shampoo and you might as well use something that has a little science behind it um, and leaving it on for a good five or 10 minutes, you know, while you're in the shower, um, you know, sometimes it's expensive, but I usually feel like clobetazole shampoo is liquid gold and, you know, people who have a lot of itching and, you know, tenderness, they, they actually will get some instant relief from using that, but it's something that can be used long-term after hair surgery and it's easy. Um, but I think it, de it depends. Like, you know, we just talked about the, the role, how important those medications can be as well. Okay. I know some of those questions are already been answered in your presentation, but I still wanted to ask you that mm -hmm. from our members. Mm -hmm. so. And then, you know, also I would say probably dutasteride is, you know, a close second because the dutasteride you know, it doesn't require any lab monitoring um, and it doesn't really have side effects, right? Doxycycline, you have to worry about antibiotic resistance. Plaquenil, you have to worry about an eye exam. Um, you know, some of the more immune suppressive drugs, you have to get blood testing done. You have to check for tuberculosis and hepatitis and all that stuff. You know, dutasteride um, is the sister molecule to finasteride but it seems to work better for scarring alopecias. And that, that was shown 
um, at Duke University several years ago. Okay. Okay. Uh, when we say the long term uh, recommendation, like what are we what are we talking about? A few years or a month or? Oh gosh, I mean, I would say open ended. <clears throat> really? Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Second question is: Is the red light therapy helpful? Is Thermodome a good option? Also, would like her opinion on PRP. If cost isn't a problem, is it worth trying to help save her? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I think the answer is we don't know. We we just don't have a whole lot of data yet investigating PRP for cicatricial alopecias. And I think part of the challenge is that it's expensive, you know, it's cost prohibitive, insurance doesn't cover it. And, you know, there's other things that have more data supporting their use for hair for cicatricial alopecia. And so, you know, I think most, I think most ethical doctors usually guide their patients toward things that have data and have some component of insurance coverage. They, they don't necessarily say, oh, let's do PRP or, oh, let me sell you an expensive laser device, you know. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the third one is, do you require patients to be an anti-inflammatory or Im immunosuppressant medication before hair transplant to prevent the flare? If so, do they impede wound, wound healing in the donor and recipient area? I think the short answer is technically no, we can transplant anyone uh, regardless of whether they're on medication. It's just a matter of, you know, <clears throat> I sleep better <laughs> knowing that they're doing something. And, and I, I say this to my male and female pattern hair loss patients too. You know, I, I can do the transplant, but I just need you to be on something that's going to help go against that underlying disease process. So, you know, if it's male or female pattern hair loss, you know, just have, just tell me you're doing some topical minoxidil a few days a week. Tell me you're taking finasteride a few days a week. Same thing for my scarring alopecia patients. Just tell me you're doing some clobetazole drops three days a week. Tell me you're doing something, you know, that is continuing to fight the inflammation and not just letting it take off and be the boss. So it's not something that once you have your uh, hair transplant, you quit everything. No, definitely not. I think this is basically what the idea is with among the people that they're reading and so on. That, so that the like hair surgery is like a cure-all. Like, like, that, yeah. like that's a final, yeah. Yeah, no, I would say, I mean, I, I think it's it's very helpful, right? Because it's, it's moving the hairs around from, you know, where you have more of them to where you have less of them. <clears throat> but it's not doing anything for the actual inflammation that is attacking those follicles. I see. Okay. And, you know, if the inflammation is not adequately controlled going into the surgery, then there's a chance that they could lose the grafts that we put in there, you know, that, that may, they may not even grow in the first place. Okay. Uh, someone says that I'm wondering if there are other illness and diseases that cause similar symptoms to those of LPP, if there are some that are misdiagnosed as LPP or vice versa. Sure. So, you know, it's interesting because we talked about CCCA. So <clears throat> it's not uncommon to get a biopsy report you know, from say, say I'll see a new patient, new African American female, maybe she's in her late 40s, you know, and she has this enlarging area of hair thinning or hair loss. And she already had a biopsy and it actually showed lichen plano pilaris. Well, guess what? They can look the same under the microscope. And so it's not uncommon for us to see patients where the actual biopsy given by the pathologist is different, but the clinical, you know, where the clinical diagnosis is usually going to be more based on, okay, where is the hair loss? Where is that scarring alopecia affecting the, the person? So, 
Okay. All right. Uh, next one is, is it possible that at least a part of the hair in the scarf part regrow? Um, is it possible that, say that again? <laughs> is it possible that at least a part of the hair in the scarred part regrow? Which means I think what they're trying to say is maybe there is a huge scar area, but only part of that starts to regrow. I don't think this is a question about the hair transplant, but in general. Um. Okay, let me see. Okay, we have, so... let's say, inch and a half, two inches of scar area, but mm -hmm. then can we expect a little corner of that area to regrow? I would say if they have intact follicles that are just teetering on the edge, you know, maybe around the edge or in the middle or wherever, like, like if they have intact follicles that maybe have some redness there and you can get that inflammation under control quickly enough, yeah. you know, either through topical steroids or steroid injections or doxycycline or, you know, any of the medicines that we talked about, then, then yes. But if it's, if it's scarred, like if it's looking like an ice rink, you know, and it's smooth and shiny skin, you know, it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. And I have also had results with oral minoxidil. You know, that's the other sort of, you know, newest medication. I, I think it took a long time for us to incorporate oral minoxidil for scarring alopecias because it doesn't really do that much for the inflammation. Um, but I like bringing it in sort of at the one to two year mark once the inflammation is under control, because it does seem to give people a little bit of a, a softer, more natural look. Okay, uh, the next one here we have, um, as I have a lupus and LPP, would it not be likely that hair transplant would just be fought off by my own body? I have quite severe scarring and any options that may would be greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of lupus and LPP, I guess. Yeah. Did, does the person, is the person on the call or was this a question? No, no. We, we usually don't like to do this as a personal thing. Like, yeah, I just try to ask it as a general. So if anyone oh. can say has lupus and LPP, wouldn't that likely be that hair transplant would just be fought off by own body? That's basically the question. Not okay. a single person. It's, you know, it's hard to answer for some any individual questions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think it depends on the degree of hair loss that this person has. You know, if they have a small area, there's a chance. I mean, I would probably do a test transplant on them and you know, just see how it grows and you know, if, it, if, if obviously if they have enough donor hair, you know, that's the other limiting factor. I see. Um, you know, hair fibers can be very helpful. You know, um, one of the tricky things about discoid lupus is that they lose the pigment in the skin. So <clears throat> especially for my, my black patients, my black females, they may have white spots that are just as hard to camouflage as the hair loss, you know, that's overlying that on their scalp. So sometimes, you know, Topic, Exfusion, um, Kaboki, there's different brands, uh, Style Edit, it's a root cover up, you know, some people really like those and they, they just help to reduce the contrast between the hair color and the scalp color. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Next question here. Do the hair transplant procedures differ gender wise? Speaking of gender, are there separate salons locations per gender? Do the hair, does what differ? Do the hair transplant procedures differ gender? Oh, Do gender? Yeah. N not really. <clears throat> No, I mean, I think the, the main difference is that for men who want to continue to wear their hair very short in the back, you know, sometimes doing the follicular unit excision is a better option for them because we're just pulling individual follicles one by one from a bigger surface area. Um, and I guess, you know, if somebody had scarring in the back and they, or maybe they had a history of a scar and they didn't want another scar, you know, the FUE might be a better choice for them. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. 
Uh, there is a some technical question I think here. The, does the red light wavelength have to be 650 nm or would be 640 be acceptable? I'm not mm -hmm. even sure what those are, but <laughs> I know that's a good question. I most of the devices that I'm aware of are somewhere between 650 and 750. Oh. But um but yeah, oh. that I don't know if I know the answer. I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that exact question. <laughs> you know, we might defer that. You know who you should do a, a call with is um, Mike Hamblin. He's at Harvard. You know, he's in that photo, uh, photo medicine oh. unit. All right. I'll get <clears> that he information. Could really, ooh, he could really give your. All right. Well, you your is, some really is, technical answers on low-level okay. light therapy. I, I'd be interested in hearing him speak, too. Sure, sure. If you can just send me the info, we'll, uh, we'll look into it, sure. Okay. No problem. All right. A uh, person said that it gets headache in the scalp and so horrible at times. Would it be from LPP or does LPP cause us severe? Yeah. yeah, it can for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. You know, and, and I think it's important that people listen to their bodies because if they're having really severe itching, burning, or tenderness, that's a sign of disease activity. Yeah, it shows that it's active. Yeah. You know, it's right. It's like a sign of like impending hair loss in those areas, you know. So I think, I think they should definitely let their uh, dermatologist know and, you know, so they can either do steroid injections or prednisone or put them on something fast that'll get that inflammation under control i mean you know obviously if this person also has a history of um migraines or fibromyalgia you know then it may be more complicated it may not be just from the lichen plano pilaris but you know possible. If, possible. yeah it's possible sure okay let's go to the next one do you have a recent data to indicate that hair transplants for FFA and LPP patients are becoming more successful with updated procedures and technology? Mm -hmm. I, I really don't think it's the, the way that the hair surgery is done necessarily that is going to predict whether it works. I think what is going to predict whether it works is how well the disease is controlled at the front end you know, before even proceeding with the hair transplant, and then how well the disease process is controlled after the surgery. I see. You know, because our techniques are really not that different, you know. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, one thing that we could do, and I don't always do it, is, you know, steroid injections into the grafted area, you know, right after surgery or right during mm -hmm. surgery, you know, that like, could you mix some of those techniques in order to get better growth? Maybe, um, but I mean, I haven't really found that to be necessary so far. Well, I think the question is because uh, nowadays, you know, almost every day things changes. Now that AI becoming almost uh, on everything, so I don't know. It could be right. new things. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. 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 I know it's dizzying how fast the world is changing, isn't it, Acho? As you speak, as you sleep. <laughs> I, know. I know. Okay, the next one is, is hair cloning still too far in the future? That's the question. This is uh, ideal since it allows that FFA and LPP patients with limited donor grafts to undergo hair transplant and also allows for repeated hair transplant if the grafts do not survive beyond X number of years. Yeah, I mean, hair cloning has been the holy grail since I got into dermatology, oh. you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and I think it continues to be, you know, we for 10 or 15, 15, 20 years, we've been saying, oh, hair cloning, it'll happen in 10 or 15 years. And it still has not happened. Um, there's been a lot of private money that has gone into this. Um, and actually, I think one of my colleagues, one of my hair transplant colleagues, this might be another possible idea for you um, for an interview. There's a gentleman, Bassam Fargio, who um, has a company in Manchester, England, that is researching cloning, and they're, they're working on that. 
Um, but again, it's, you know, it's baby steps. It's a lot of money and a lot of time to, to get there. And we still are not there yet. Another 10, 15 years, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. The next one is when you have a, a scarring alopecia again, well, let me see, is that same question or similar? At what point are you a candidate for a hair transplant? Some some say stable for six months, some say two years. Does this mean zero symptoms in that amount of time? Can you stable? Can uh, can you be stable with meds during this time? I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think the more aggressively people can treat their condition leading up to the hair surgery. And the better they can, you know, stay on something afterwards, the better their chance of of survival of those grafts. Mm -hmm. So there is really no time, six months, a year, two years. We you know, it's interesting because, you know, it also depends on where where the person is in their personal timeline. You mm -hmm. know, like I had a lady recently who she was scheduled for a hair surgery for FFA with another doctor. And he was like, oh, well, it's already burnt out. So we can go ahead and do it. And I was sort of like, eh, you've never gotten any medical therapy. Let's go back to square one and put you on medical therapy, you know? <clears throat> and who knows who, you know, am I right? Is he right? I don't know. Because I mean, she already had pretty significant loss of her sideburns. So, you know, not enough data again. The yeah. conservative, right. The conservative side, you know, I think before you're going to spend a bunch of money is get on the medication. You know, it just, to me, it seems like a no brainer. <laughs> I know, I know. But you just don't know when that uh, thing got stable so I can count my year or six months or two years. That's the. Well, no. And we don't know oh. what, what medicine is going to work best for people either. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. you know, the, the perfect cocktail that works for one person, it may not even touch their inflammation for the second person. Oh, I remember from my case, like almost 17, 18 years ago, uh, Dr. Donovan was looking after me in, in Toronto. So he told me from day one, he said, yours is very aggressive. Almost said that whatever you do is not going to help. He didn't say that, but I think he meant it. So everybody is different. Some people, it's like with one medicine, they uh, they recover very quickly. Mm -hmm. Did you end up taking any medicine? What did you end up taking? Very little, doctor. Very little I did. I knew that because even I was taking it, it was just going by bunches. And by, like within six months, I lost almost 80%. Oh, my gosh. And I had a hair. I really... Wow. So it was very quick. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I guess, you know, the disease was there before that we didn't know about it. Because we mm -hmm. did one in 2001. And they said, it's all clear. We did a biopsy. But actually, uh, when I look at the biopsy on the on the paper, it says there may be possibility of LPP. Mm -hmm. She never mentioned it to me because she didn't know. Almost 20 years. So. And that was, what, what was the purpose of that biopsy? Was it taken? Because I had a very small uh, open area with no scarring, nothing. Mm -hmm. But uh, so she looked at it. She says it could be anything, obviously. There oh were my no gosh. sign of inflammation. Wow. Then, then the four years later, it took off and just everything. At the time, if we treated, probably would have been good. Yeah. But no, nobody knows. But I'm glad maybe I didn't take much medication. So you never know. I yeah. did about six, five, six medication at the time. Oh, not, really? Yeah. Not everything was available like 18 years ago. So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's go back to, to the members' questions. Uh, it says, my dermatologist said that the transplant is only appropriate if on remission. Again, similar question. Is that true? If so, how is remission determined? What is the success rate of hair transplant with LPP? When it fails, does it aggravate the disease? This is important. What does the area transplanted looks like after it transplant fails? Hmm. Many questions here, but mm -hmm. okay. I think this so... is important here. When it fails, does it aggravate the disease? It makes it worse. Well, 
Well, I will say, okay, so I will tell you a story from one of the very first cases that we transplanted. Um, and it was a woman who had very advanced frontal fibrosing alopecia. And she had been treated with Plaquenil and, you know, other topical steroids. And she actually had a biopsy. She had a repeat biopsy from her pathologist showing that there wasn't active inflammation. And so basically her dermatologist was like, okay, you can have the green light to get the hair surgery. And so she mm -hmm. sent her to me and, you know, I, I didn't really see much evidence of inflammation. So I was like, all right, well, we can try it. And we tried it and it really did not grow. And so that's kind of proof that even if the biopsy says you're in remission, even if the dermatologist says you're in remission, there's still no guarantees, <laughs> you know? And I, I think the lower your expectations are going into hair transplant, the happier you're going to be with whatever growth you get, you know? And, and if it doesn't grow, it just looks like, it just looks like bare skin. That's it, you know? Okay. All right, we're getting almost there. We got five minutes. Uh, so my dermatologist says, give me plus plasmodium, which is chloroquine. What is the difference in to hydrochloroquine? I stopped taking plasmodium because it affected my eyes. I woke up in the mornings, my eyes were itching, dry, as if I was reading or working on the computer the whole day. Can you advise, please? Oh. Boy, that's a detailed question. I know, I know. You that's know what? A, I left it to the end. <laughs> you know what? Let me research that. Um, okay. and, and I'll okay. email you with that, Acho. Sure, sure. No problem. Yeah. I, I don't, I can't remember. You know, I'm sure Jeffrey Donovan could probably give you that. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, uh -huh. we, we had a good thing about six months ago, eight months ago. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah he's probably so do good. It once a year, yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm sure I can, I, I have a textbook on my shelf that I could probably quickly reference and email you back. So you're- I'll send you the question again and it's no, no rush. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, this is, I think, uh, this is from me. Uh, in one of your video, you mentioned about quick weave and you were against that procedure, I remember. Can you please tell us the problems with that for our members that are using or thinking of using it? Mm -hmm. quick weave quick weave yeah yes. i know you mentioned that in one of your video i watched that with somebody yeah <laughs> you were not very happy no well my patient was just so you know beside herself yes you know but basically what 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 is done is that and this is usually you know done in the african-american female population they put like a stocking cap over their head and then they apply super glue or something along those lines gorilla glue i think that was the one that made the national gorilla news glue? gorilla glue do you remember seeing that in the news no it was maybe a year or two ago and then they apply they apply they hair drop, if they drop on my skin i can't get rid of it right oh my god yeah. so they put the glue on through the stocking cap and then they they attach the hair you know they attach you know, either pieces or extension, you know, to the, yes. and, and then, so it looks really good for a short time period. And then when they pull it off, usually it rips out all their existing hair. Yeah. So it's not a good idea. No, I don't, I don't recommend it. I, I don't, I I've never heard it in our group, anybody using it, but I don't know, maybe they are, or maybe they're thinking of using it. So it's a no, no. Yeah, quick weaves. Mm, yeah, those can be very damaging. Mm -hmm. You have the last question. I wasn't going to ask you this, but I will anyway. I know it's hard to answer. Um, it says that the the white hair transplant is so expensive in U.S. and Canada compared to some of the other countries, which I don't mention the names. Uh, so why is this difference? Like huge difference. Some of the cases like maybe four, five, six times less. So is there mm -hmm. a, a health issue there? Is there something that do you know of? I think the main dish, <clears throat> the main difference is that they're not regulating. Some of these governments are not regulating who is actually doing the surgery. 
Um, and so, you know, they're, they're kind of endorsing, you know, they're, I, I think by, by not regulating it, they're sort of turning a blind eye and, and boosting their medical tourism, if you will. Um, but I think it's really important for governments, you know, I mean, that's, that's the role that the FDA plays in protecting consumers from, you know, unproven treatment options, you know, it, um, the, the state medical board within every state of the United States, like you have to jump through a lot of hoops in order to maintain your medical license. And there's laws on who can cut the skin, you know, who can perform surgery. You have to be a licensed medical professional, you know, um, and in some of these countries, there are no such laws on the books. And, you know, they're doing hair transplants in nail salons, you know, and they're really? using... Yeah, they're using, you know, and especially with the follicular unit excision harvesting, the FUE, you know, that that really sort of like was the beginning of what we call black market hair transplant surgery because you didn't actually have to cut a bunch of skin. You didn't have to sew it up. You didn't have to have this whole team. You could be one little person. You could be in a nail salon you know, all you needed to know how to do was inject lidocaine and then you could bore the scalp, you know, thousands just bunch, of times. Just bunch of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it, it, it sort of, you know, unleashed this whole sort of cottage industry of um, really bad hair transplants that were getting done. And then the problem was that patients were uh, going back to their home countries and there was nothing that their doctors could do for them because they basically had robbed their entire donor area of healthy hair. They had over harvested from the back of their scalp and, and there was really nothing they could do to, to help them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, so I always get nervous, you know, and I, I feel like it's sometimes my most educated, wealthy patients who will say, oh, well, I'm going to get stem cell treatments in Mexico. And I'm like, well, why are you going to Mexico to get stem cell treatments? You know, what if something goes wrong? How are you going to follow up? Who's going to be responsible for and that? Things, you know, things go and, wrong they, it was you know and they say, oh, the United States is so far behind. Oh, you know, I want something that, you know, it's cutting edge, you know, and, and well, guess what? There's a reason the FDA is looking out for us and trying to make sure that we don't end up blinded or, you know, with infections in our bodies or our bloodstreams, you know. So I, I say buyer beware, you know, people who want to travel to these foreign countries and get stuff done, you know, just remember you, you know, what's the old adage? You get what you pay for. Exactly. And, you know, we say that in the hair transplant community a lot, you know, that the cheapest hair surgery will ultimately end up being the most expensive you've ever gotten. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm. Well, uh, I think this is it. Well, I do really appreciate. Thank you very much for uh, being our guest today. So, uh, I'm well, sure it was such a pleasure. And if I can ever help you in any way, I really am so proud of you for continuing to keep this group uh, motivated and informed, and you know, sure. looking sure. look feeling positive. I always say that you know when you not feeling well, the best thing to do is just help others. That's, that will definitely ease the pain. That is, boy, is that true. Yeah. That is true. And you're such a kind, yeah. gracious man. It's truly a pleasure knowing you and working with you. This, uh, this group has survived because of nice people in there and people like, you know, professionals like you that come and help us. Yeah. How and many members do you have now? Well, right now we have 3,300. Wow. We have about, I think, 67 different countries. Yeah, it's quite Wow. A Most of them are quiet. They don't usually, but, you know, uh, but it's still it's, a, I think, 87% active group, which is very good. And what is the main platform that you guys all communicate on? Uh, basically, Facebook. Okay, Facebook. Okay. Facebook, yes. And then I you can you can PM each other. You can message each other. Uh -huh. and they do speak obviously to each other to get some uh, mm -hmm. extra help but uh, yeah I don't know Facebook did a great job I think in this kind of thing social media this is the only thing I think it works for social media the other things I'm not sure about it but but uh, support groups are probably the best thing for mm -hmm. 
That is terrific. And you saw this seven years ago, so when you invited me. Thank you. I know. Yeah, I know. I was like, please let me into your group. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. So All have right. a day, and we'll probably right. talk again. Thank you. Okay. Sounds good. Have a great evening. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.